today is uh, Dr. Chao Tang from Peking University telling us about Drosophila embryogenesis. Um, Dr. Tang, please. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm talking about, uh, uh, talk about scaling in, uh, in Drosophila embryogenesis. The, uh, how come I cannot move my slide? Sorry about this. Sometimes the, uh, if I change to laser pointer, it was this problem. Let me change it back to, oops. Oops. Okay. So, uh, so scaling in de development is really a very uh, ubiquitous phenomena. Uh, so in, in, in these three examples, uh, one uh, Xenopus, two Drosophila, you can see that the, uh, uh, because of the environmental fluctuations, the egg sizes change, uh, but the eventual uh, 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 body, body shape, body plan uh, develop perfectly in proportion. Uh, and this Drosophila different oxygen uh, pressure and this is a different temperature, for example, so this is uh, a, a fascinating scaling phenomena. The, huh, I have to fix this. Okay, so the uh, very quick introduction about uh, uh, positional information. It's a very important concept in development is positional information. Namely, a cell has to know its position uh, in, in the body, in three-dimensional, uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the egg. And this uh, has been, this is done in several ways. I'm sorry, somehow. Okay, so this is, this. Uh, in, for example, in Drosophila, this information is being provided by morphogen. Uh, the morphogen uh, typically forms a gradient and the, uh, the cell reads the gradients of the morphogen and determine its position. And for example, then the, uh, we, we call this the morphogen gradient as coding and then the, uh, the cell interpret the, the, uh, the, the morphogen gradient as decoding. And this is usually done by some genetic network or trans, uh, transcription network. Okay, and the morphogen is usually uh, formed by diffusion. So, for example, in Drosophila, there's a, a, a picoid mRNA deposited by, by the mother, and the protein is being made uh, at the head and it diffuses across the entire embryo, uh, but at the same time being degraded. And so if you write down the equation of diffusion and with a source and uh, degradation, you get a exponential a solution, right? Uh, with a typical length scale determined by diffusion constant and degradation uh, rate. Uh, because it's formed by diffusion, it's a, so it has a fixed length scale and this has no scaling. So larger and smaller embryo, they cannot develop in proportion. Uh, so that's, uh, that's obvious. But Drosophila seems to be, uh, uh, they overcome this problem. Indeed, their morphogens has exponential profile has been measured in many experiments uh, with a typical length scale, uh, despite uh, the, uh, the, the size of the uh, embryo, but they have very uh, uh, precise scaling pattern uh, along the embryo. So plotted for, for example, plotted here is the, uh, for different embryo lengths, uh, and then the uh, vertical axis is the position of the stripes uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, developmental pattern. As you can see, it doesn't matter how long, or how large the, the embryo is, these uh, are stripes, they're situated at very good proportion. Uh, so this is a very good scaling. And how, how this is achieved? And, uh, and people speculated this must be done by more than one morphogen, right? 
if, if a single morphogen is a typical landscape, there's no scaling. But how about two morphogens? So indeed, several uh, groups has explored the possibility of using two morphogens to achieve scaling. Uh, so let's go into a little bit of detail here. You have two morphogens, large embryo and smaller embryo, both decaying exponentially with the same uh, 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 land scale. And if we rescale the embryo so that we all measure them in the relative uh, size, we all divide it by the length of the embryo, and the two morphogens, of course, then will behave differently in the large and smaller embryo. So if you do this for many different sizes and the, the morphogen uh, profile will change uh, uh, when the size will change, and this can be easily seen if the morphogen is indeed uh, exponential decay, you simply replace the absolute uh, axis uh, x by the relative uh, uh, y is uh, uh, x divided by the embryo lens. So you can see immediately the the, uh, the, uh, the embryo lens y enters into this uh, uh, the profile. But you can see clearly, at least for this middle position, indeed, the, there's no difficulty for, for example, a transcription factor uh, network to tell the middle position because at this uh, position, the two morphogens are equal to each other. But the question is, how about the other positions? Can they do it and how they do it? For example, if we want to determine, if the geocephala, they want to determine the boundary at the 35% of the body length for larger and smaller embryo, and they should express the same genes here, or the boundary should be the same uh, uh, position. And, but in this map, when, when the uh, 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 embryo size changes, they, the morphogen profile changes, okay? And the 0.5 position is here. As you can see, in different size embryo, the, 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 the morphogens have different values. But if we plot this pair of morphogens for different size of the embryo, uh, they would trace a line like this from small to large embryos. If we plot them into this uh, morphogen space, two-dimensional space, or two morphogens. Then if the transporting factor network, the decoder is so smart, they, they can determine the, the cell fate along this line then everything should be solved, right? So this line is purely determined by this morphogen profile from, from uh, changing from large to smaller embryo. And if the transcription factor can read this uh, uh, pair of morphogens and then make the same decision, as long as they're on this line, then this cell fate is uniquely determined. And of course, this can be applied to other uh, uh, cell fates. For example, the 65 percent, and this way, and we call this decoder a ideal scaling decoder. It can perfectly de uh, decide the cell fate. In this case, for simplification, we have only cell three cell fates separated by 35 percent and 65 percent. And obviously, this can be done by more cell fates. Uh, I can, I can. Uh, uh, I can partition this uh, uh, morphogen phase space by arbitrarily by uh, cell phase uh, at arbitrary position, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, et cetera, okay? And also I can do this not only for the uh, 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 the wild type embryo, I can also do this for a, a mutant embryo as I will discuss later. And by the way, if the uh, morphogen indeed decays exponentially, uh, both of them, and then each position can be expressed uh, by mathematical formulas. So each position in this morphogen space has a unique uh, uh, the, uh, value of, uh, of, uh, of a morphogen, uh, morphogen value. So, the, so it will determine uniquely a cell fate. Okay, so this is to say, given the profile of the morphogens, in this case, are two exponentials, the decoder structure is uniquely determined, determined by scaling, this, this structure. 
And this is the same uh, 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 map I plotted here. And to make an analogy, this is somewhat similar to uh, GPS uh, uh, positioning. So we have like, for example, uh, three satellites to determine uh, location. And then this uh, the location determined by the relative time for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the signal to pass of, for, from the different satellites. And here is determined by the relative concentration of the two uh, morphogens. However, in Drosophila, the problem is harder. In GPS uh, positioning, the, uh, the, uh, the Earth doesn't change its size, right? Uh, but in Drosophila, the size changes. So it's, a, it's, a, it's similar, but it's a more complicated problem. But precise because it's required by scaling, we can also determine the geometric structure of the decoder. And then, as you may imagine, that if one satellite is a, a, a small function and the, the time has changed a little bit, then the position will be determined uh, uh, wrong. Similarly, in Geosophila, if the morphogen uh, has some uh, defects or some mutants, the, the cell, they don't know, the, 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 all the cells, they don't know, they just read the morphogen values. So their pattern will be shifted. And then because of this map is very precise, we can precisely uh, uh, predict how much this pattern will shift. So for, for example, if I have a mutant, and this is, this is a, uh, a wire type of different sizes, this is a, uh, a size, a standard size, this is a shorter size, and this is a larger size. I have all this map determined, but if I have, uh, uh, mutant and the morphogen is perturbed. Instead of tracing a profile like this, it will go like this uh, red line. But the cells in the embryo will simply read along the length of the embryo and then uh, express genes according to uh, the, the, the cell fate of this map. Okay, so to be more, uh, to give you an example, if I have a mutant which I double. <laughs> The morphogen uh, 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 concentration, uh, the, the one of the morphogen concentration. Then instead of the morphogen, we're tracing a line like this. They were tracing this red line. Okay, and then, but I can still determine precisely the where the morphogen will change the fate, uh, where the, uh, the the cell will change fate, the, the boundary. So, for example, if this uh, originally. The, the cell fate uh, boundary decision is at 3.5, and this mutant will be 3, uh, 0.48. 0 0.35, and then that would be 0.48. Okay. And then this can be, uh, uh, I can construct a map uh, to, uh, for the y type position of the uh, cell fate and the mutant position. And this will be called this a, a fate map. Uh, so I should emphasize this fate map can be precise constructed as long as you give me the profile of the uh, mutant. Okay, so let's apply this uh, uh, idea to real uh, uh, data to real, to, uh, to, uh, in Drosophila. As I said, the Drosophila has uh, uh, exponential decay morphogen, picoid, but it also has another two morphogens, uh, nanos and poso. Uh, you don't have to know the details, but the the profile of these morphogens are measured uh, exponentially, uh, experimentally to a fairly high precision. So we can just use the profile as input. And this is the only input in our model. Okay. And then the, the, uh, for the large and smaller embryo, the, uh, uh, in the relative position, in, in the relative coordinates, the morphogen profile changes as we discussed in the toy model. However, the decoder should be such that the downstream gene expression uh, uh, scales. Uh, and then here we have, we show like five gap genes, which is a directed downstream of the uh, morphogens. So to make, make, make things uh, uh, more clear, we color these uh, uh, regions of the gap gene expression just more or less arbitrarily uh, according to the uh, amplitude of, 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 of the gap genes into a eight regions. But in fact, the cell decision, the cell fate can be classified into a hundred uh, fates in Josophila, as people showed before. 
Okay, so now the the uh, uh, the morphogen space is three dimensional, and so if we do the same thing as we did in the two dimensional uh, uh, toy model uh, for the Y type, for from head to tail, we trace trace, trace a profile like this, and if the uh, uh, if the embryo has larger or smaller size, the morphogen will change. Uh, 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 so we we'll sweep into a line, uh, into this, uh, uh, will become a two-dimensional manifold. And the, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, for example, if the, the Y type is here, and then the, we I won't insist the 44% 40, 40, uh, 40 self-aid decision is the same uh, as I change the length of the profile, as, as I change the, uh, the, uh, the length of the embryo. We we'll trace a line up to here. So this is a line of 40% uh, percent cell fate. Smaller uh, embryo and large embryo. And this way we can completely determine this uh, uh, decoder map. And to make things even more realistic, we put noise into the morphogens so that instead of a line, you have this uh, uh, you know, noisy points. And in the end, you get uh, a, a decoder map like this. Uh, and, and these different colors are indicated by here. They should have different cell fates. And very interestingly, and if you construct a map like this, the a different cell fates can be separated by essentially by planes. OK, so it, it, it essentially linear uh, 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 separation uh, can can uh, determine the cell phase boundary very well. So we will just use the planes to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to separate this uh, uh, different cell phase. Uh, this uh, some from uh, from some, uh, uh, the views from other perspectives. You can see the planes can separate the different cell phase very well. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, any questions? Okay, so uh, so in the two-dimensional example, uh, we sh we showed that if we double the uh, first morphogen, the the uh, the dosage, the, uh, the the pattern will be shifted. But the how much will be shifted it can be precise pre uh, predicted by the map, right? And this is also true. Uh, for three-dimensional uh, uh, morphogen in three-dimensional morphogen space, and so in this case we have a, uh, for example, I, I showed the example of double mutants, uh, bicoid and torso double mutants, and the we have the mutant uh, gene expression for the gap genes. We have the Y-type gene expression gap genes, and we can map this uh, uh, position of different, for example, the peaks and the boundaries from the Y type to mutant, and then we can make this uh, 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 fade map. These are the yellow squares. And this is uh, this uh, red line, this two dimensional example, okay? And then the black line is a prediction from our model. So you can see it's very well predicted, quantitatively uh, mat matches the exper experimental uh, observation. And we've done this for all the uh, uh, mutants, uh, 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 Drosophila mutants, morphology mutants, for which quantitative data uh, are available. So this, all these are shown are here. So you can see in all cases, the, uh, the, the experimental data, uh, the yellow squares uh, fits very well with our uh, theoretic prediction, uh, the uh, black mm, solid curve. So this is a very quantitative, uh, agreement between theory and experiment. Uh, and also I have emphasized there's no parameter in this, in this, uh, 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 in, in this prediction. The only uh, input is the morphogen profile, which is measured from experiments. Okay. And furthermore, we can use the knowledge of this map to gain information about gene regulation. For example, uh, it has been known that for this boundary, 
nerves boundary, this anterior, a posterior nerves boundary, three morphogens are participating to set this boundary. Uh, Bicoid positively regulating, a maternal hunchback is also positive, negative, negative, positive regulating this way, and, and then torso uh, negatively regulates this boundary. How do the experimentalists know the, the, the regulation? This is inferred by, for example, knockout bicoid, and then this boundary will uh, retreat into this uh, 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 anterior uh, uh, direction so that you know the bicoid must be uh, pushing this boundary. Uh, by similar uh, logic, you, if you knock out this, the boundary will move. And if you knock out this, the boundary will move. So you can infer the, uh, the direction of regulation, positive or, or, or negative. And then Dunk? it has been a puzzle. Why you need all three morphogens to set this one boundary? Uh, Dr. Tang, you have five minutes. Left. OK. So is this just redundancy or something else? And then it's very uh, straightforward uh, to see it's not redundancy. It's required by scaling. Uh, so from our map, uh, we can also uh, infer the bicoid is possibly regulating uh, this boundary. Maternal hunchback is also possibly regulating the boundary. And then torso is negative regulating the boundary simply by this, uh, 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 this uh, predicted uh, fade map if you, if you knock out these uh, morphogens. Uh, but then this boundary is here. You then you see why this boundary uh, is has to be regulated by three morphogens is simply because this boundary is tilted in this space. But why this boundary is has to be tilted? Uh, because it's re required by scaling, right? This is purely constructed by a scaling argument. Uh, and not only that, we can also determine the quanti determine quantitatively how much each morphogens are contributing to setting up this boundary. Okay, so this seemingly redundancy is really uh, a requirement by scaling. And the finally, how this decoder can be achieved by gene regulation. So this is a purely a phenological model. It's a sort, sort of abstract model uh, with, without referring to any uh, uh, genetic network uh, structure. Uh, can, this, can this really be uh, realized by genetic network? So we took the uh, canonical gap gene network from the literature, and then we try to fit the data, not only asking it to, pre uh, to uh, produce the gap gene profiles, but also has to, to satisfy scaling. And these requirements more or less were set uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, 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 the were satisfied that the uh, the scaling uh, 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 you know the, the we more or less make the, uh, the the decoder scaling decoder. So, for example, in our uh, purely phenological decoder, and then this is the uh, uh, separation of the cell fades uh, in certain mutants, for example, and then these are the, from the ODE model, and they are quite similar. So in short, the ODE models seems can do the job. There's no mystery here. And then also this ODE model uh, uh, fitted uh, parameters this way by scaling, they can also make reasonable predictions uh, uh, on the uh, morphology mutants. Not as well as our uh, purely abstract uh, phenomenological model, but it, it's okay. Okay, so let me uh, summarize. Uh, scale, so scaling determines a decoder structure. The decoder quantitatively accounts for nearly all the gap gene uh, phenotypes of morphogen mutants in Drosophila. And the decoder contains rich information about regulation and coding decoding strategy. I really didn't have time to uh, talk much about this. Uh, you can also quantitatively uh, uh, predict or infer the coding, decoding, the contribution of, uh, of each morphogen at each position, uh, how much each morphogen contribute at each position. 
so it, all this can be quantitatively uh, uh, calculated and then verified experimentally by some experiments. And finally, the decoder is implementable by gene regulation. Um, so from the known gap gene network, it seems it can do the job. So if I want to summarize the work, it's really scaling dictates the decoder structure. So this is uh, interesting because uh, uh, you know my background is in physics and and and, and Jianghua's background is also in physics. So in, in physics, we know that the symmetry uh, plays a very important role in dictating the interaction. Uh, and then here, a scaling is really a symmetry. Uh, it also dictates the genetic interaction. In this case, is a decoder structure. OK, so let me thank the people who did the work. And this work uh, was done mainly by my uh, graduate student, uh, Shen Jinxiang. So he, uh, he was a physics major uh, undergrad and then uh, did his PhD with me. And he's uh, now uh, doing a postdoc also in Peking University, but changed his field into uh, fluid mechanics. <laughs> and uh, also we got a lot of help from uh, my colleague Feng Liu, uh, who told us a lot about Drosophila and scaling. And if, if you are interested, we post it by archive and we'll post a, we will post in a few days a more updated version. Okay, thank you. Good. I'm happy to answer any questions. So we have a few questions. Um, the first one is from Nikhil Harginis. Uh, apologies for, uh, and uh, he says, um, did you also try looking at the dorsal venture gradient um, for example, snail, DPP, et cetera. What are your thoughts on defining such parameters for larval and adult structures with respect to cuticular segmentation for organ positioning? Ah, good question. Uh, no, we didn't look at the dorsal venture, uh, uh, and, and, but, uh, but I should say not all the uh, scaling is determined by, is set by this mechanism. Okay, for example, in the, uh, Imagine a disc of Josophila. Uh, it's a the, the the scaling is set by a scaling morphogen. Uh, they say you the, the morphogen can be scaled. You don't have to use three morphogens. Use one morphogen, but with some feedback mechanism, you make this morphogen scale, and that seems to be another mechanism. So so uh, so in different organ development, they may use different organ uh, uh, mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, another question from John Betchhofer. Uh, in the early part of the talk, did you show that two morphogens could account for the scaling? Since there are three, is the function of the third to give more robustness? A very good question also. Uh, yes, uh, in a way, uh, but why not four? Uh, so, you know, this, so we, 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 that's why we didn't quite answer this question. Uh, we, we kind of avoided this question. Yes, three is better. Uh, and then uh, uh, three certainly will make this, uh, all these decision boundaries more linear. Like uh, they, they can be separated uh, um, very well simply by a plane. You know, they don't have to be a plane. In two, you can see they are curved, right? Uh, if you use only, uh, see here. So if you see only two morphogens and this decision boundaries, as you can see, if they have to satisfy scaling, they have to be curved. And if you imagine you have a genetic network to make a separation, if, if it's nonlinear, then it's a little difficult, I would say, right? So it's, it's linear, it seems to be easier. So maybe three morphogens can, can you know, can make it a, a, approximately linear. Okay, uh, one more question from Cheng Shi Tian. Um, I saw that you discussed the effects of the length of variation, a Gaussian noise added to the L, have you considered the effects of molecular noises of genes? The expression levels of the two ends, y equals to zero and one, uh, could be very low, which makes the relative uncertainty very high. Yes, we did. Uh, that's why we, 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 we did not use this uh, uh, no noise 
this uh, this uh, this uh, the, uh, the, uh, the this map. We use we instead we use the noise. This this noise is added by the morphogen. So you can imagine that I add noise by the to the morphogen, and, and at the end for this big coil, the, the level is very low. So the noise is very big actually here. Okay, so we add this noise, molecular noise, and uh, the Poisson noise. And that, so that's why you have this. Uh, then you have you sample many many different embryos of uh, uh, different sizes. Then you get this. Uh, 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 you get this uh, these points instead of this line, and that's that's why you you have something like uh, you know uh, the picture like uh, on on the right here. Yes, we did consider noise. Great, uh, great. Uh, any more questions for Dr. Tang? Um, then um, we will thank Dr. Tang for the talk. Um, and, uh, thank you. Um, he may not be able to stay long afterwards because of uh, the time difference, uh, but if anyone has more questions, they're welcome to email him directly.